All right, welcome back to Hour 2 of Dr. J Radio Live. And, of course, this is the time we do some plugins. Don't forget about our contest for Contact in the Desert, where we will be giving out one ticket per week beginning in mid-April. Go to contactinthedesert.com slash Dr. J, D-R-J, and of course, to see all the upcoming guests, as well as we take guest requests and previous interviews, go to drjradiolive.com, and that is the same name for all the social media accounts, D-R-J Radio Live, and Twitter, Instagram, Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, you name it, it's there. Also, don't forget a huge event coming up in November, specifically November 5th, 2015 in Arizona. And this also has to do with this part two of this special interview today. And that is the Sky Fire Summit, also being the 40th anniversary of Travis Walton's event, which you'll get a little bit of the background in what we're going to be speaking with this hour and a continuation of what you heard last hour. Zero International happening in Los Angeles, Saturday, April 4th, which you just heard Debbie Jordan Cobble speak about her experiences. You will get to see her live that night as well as our, our two guests, which are Travis Walton and filmmaker Tracy Torme. Uh, Travis and Tracy, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. Great to be here. Great to be here, Dr. J. It's an absolute honor to have both of you on at the same time. And Tracy, I believe this is our first time on record, finally speaking. So I'm actually really excited to to speak to both of you and give the listeners out there a good preview of what you're going to be speaking about when we actually get to this April 4th event. Let me backtrack first and go direct the first question to Tracy. Tracy, were you interested in ufology prior to you hearing about Travis's case, or what made you go down the path of taking a case such as Travis's and putting it into the mainstream media as you did with the film Fire in the Sky? Yes, I was always interested, and when I went to, I went to film school at USC, uh, I made a decision when I was there that I wanted to do sort of the penultimate UFO film. I had sort of been a little bit dissatisfied with Close Encounters. I think there's a lot of good things about Close Encounters, but there are certain things about it that that really I did not like. And so I did have an idea from a pretty early stage that I wanted to do a UFO film at some point in my career. Now, when was it that you actually met Travis and started looking into his case as being the one that you wanted to write about and and, and sh- in essence, show on the big screen? Well, I owned the rights to the book Missing Time by Bud Hopkins, and I actually spent three years in Hollywood trying to launch that as a movie. And uh, at that time, really, people were not familiar with abductions, and uh, and, and so after a sort of a, a long, frustrating time of trying to launch that, I thought, well, maybe what I need is a, the best abduction story of all time. And I was of the mind back then that that was the Travis Walton story. And I second that motion. I definitely agree it is with all the evidence, the physical evidence, that even at the trees, that you could still see the growth there, the, all the witnesses, the fact that he was gone for so long, just so much about it. Now, I know we don't need to relive this, Travis. We go through this pretty much every time. But I'm just going to ask you one question regarding what happened November 5th, 1975. In the past, you've, state, you've stated what happened, essentially, that you got out of the truck, you were kind of show off if, if you want to put that term, in front of your friends, and something hit you, and that's what rendered you unconscious, and your friends took off. Recently, you started to say that this, you don't think that, that the extraterrestrials necessarily took you because they wanted to do any experiments on you, but that more so they took you as an ambulance call to save your life. And I'm starting to look at your case through those lengths and really starting to see that makes more sense. When did you start to realize that this may have been more of an ambulance call than it necessary it was uh, one of the other cases of literally just being plucked out of their homes and studied? Well, it was kind of a gradual process, you know. It was just an accumulation of things over time that just kept pointing in that direction. Plus, you know, uh, having enough time to get over the overriding emotional impact that it had on me at the time, which, of course, was negative. And, you know, Fire in the Sky did a very good job of portraying that. But, 
you know, as time went on, I realized that my negative perceptions had more to do with the circumstances that I was in rather than their actual intention. Um, you know, people are always talking about the alien agenda in the singular, and I, I believe there's probably as many agendas are there as there are species, of, and I think there's quite a few species. I would definitely have to agree that with so many different... If there's if there's life on, for instance, just on our planet, going across the pond, you have a different agenda within humanity. If you have species that are completely different in makeup, in their culture, I just imagine that the agendas are completely opposite on that end. Now, let's talk specifically about alien abduction as a whole. I personally think that this is the route that people need to be studying since this is where you're going to find your answers. If you're looking at UFO sightings reports and you're actually looking at the film of what you've recorded in the sky, that's not going to give you an idea of how these extraterrestrials interact, how these extraterrestrials deal with their machinery, or anything along the lines of giving you an insight into their agenda. Tracy, when you said alien abd- people didn't know much about alien abduction and you really wanted to put the best case out there, I, I get the impression that you recognize the importance of why alien abduction is so important, because to me, I think it has the answers there. Do you feel that's the reason that you chose alien abduction topic per se rather than crash room retrievals or, or anything else available within ufology? Well, again, I, I, I'm not trying to make the same reference the second time, but but Hopkins had a very strong influence on me. I got to know him quite well, and I used to, uh, when I was working at Saturday Night Live in New York, he was living in New York, and he used to call me up and invite me over to sit in on his abduction sessions. So there were many times that I would go into Greenwich Village and be sort of the witness of his sessions, of his hypnotic sessions with abductees. That's how I met Kathy from Intruders, uh, Debbie Jordan, I guess. And um, so I think that he had a lot of influence on me in realizing that this was a very important thing that was going on and was sort of groundbreaking at that time. And I, I didn't originally lean in that direction but again sort of getting to know Hopkins and then I I was actually the person that introduced David Jacobs to Bud Hopkins and got them together as well so I sort of uh, got involved in abductions uh, by accident but it did have a very strong influence on me after the stuff that I had witnessed and now Travis you obviously I would imagine being in your position all the questions over the last 40 years probably one of the first people ask you is what do they look like what do they talk like and essentially the same reason why I think everybody needs to look at alien abduction as having the answers to what we're looking for in ufology because you've had to answer those same questions thousands upon thousands of time upon the times would you say to anybody out there who's also experienced this that they sh- too should step forward because they are giving they they hold missing keys to the puzzles that you, other ufologists need to be looking at? Well, you know, whether people come forward or not, I've always told them is a, is an individual uh, choice. You know, uh, they have to look at how it's going to affect their lives, their own you know their own psyche. Those, you know, immediate family members and, and uh, uh, you know, associates, not just the world at large. You know? Of course, it would be, you know, beneficial for people to come forward, especially if they can document what they're saying. And that doesn't mean that people who can't document uh, aren't telling the truth. But as far as, you know, providing the kind of... Um, motivation on the part of the public to accept that this is real you know there is a kind of obligation you know the old in extraordinary claims uh, require extraordinary uh, proof and uh, you know at least some indication that, that, that you know people can you know uh, rely on what they're saying I de- definitely agree with that statement you just said that the 
absence of evidence definitely doesn't mean there's evidence of absence. And yes, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but there's certain things that you have to look outside the box for those answers. I think this topic is a little harder, actually a lot harder than anyone else because of the fact that you have you don't have as much evidence to deal with. And then more so, you have a lot of people who make up experiences to sort of fit in and you have to weed those people out. Now, Tracy, in your step to find the ultimate cases and your association with Bud Hopkins, which ultimately led you to having the series of intruders, the the television series, which was based on Debbie, weren't so you saw the process with Bud yourself. Didn't you see how many people had to be weeded out in that process before they got to the level of getting to uh, hypnotic regression? Oh, that's an excellent point, and that's even more true today than it was back then, because so many people now have heard about these stories and the possibility that they've been influenced by that, even unconsciously, uh, is is much stronger. And you're absolutely right. I mean, that was one of the main things even back in those days was to separate the wheat from the chaff and to separate the true people of experience from people that were sort of wannabes or had had fantasies or uh, delusions. And that still remains very, very true with abductions. You really have to be very careful with uh, the experience and make sure that the experience is a real one. But what I did discover was that there was a subculture of people in America and around the world that had had this experience that didn't want to have this experience. In most cases, they were very reluctant participants in it, Uh, which is one of the main problems that I have with the whole abduction process is that I don't think people are asked their permission to, (laughs) to be a part of the abduction experience. They're basically taken, whether they like it or not, uh, which basically makes them victims in a, in a lot of ways. And I do believe that. I believe that uh, most abductees are actually victims, and it's not always a very pleasant experience. Exactly why so many people have post-traumatic st- stress symptoms following these, because not only do they not ask to be a part of the process, they don't ask to be taken at the times they do, driving or, or sleeping. I just can't even imagine, to, to begin to imagine the amount of trauma that goes that they go through. But what I can tell you is my experience of seeing each person that steps forward and, and tells their experiences, the amount of support they have amongst others skyrockets. And then so does the the probability that the others around them will come out and do the same thing. And the prime example I have is when Dr. Lear, our, our departed, beloved but departed Dr. Roger Lear, before he passed, we did two documentaries, the first one being the Alien Human Project. And we needed three people that had been abducted. Nobody really wanted to come forward except one who was very outspoken at the time who had had something removed. But one of them was a member of Ciro and she asked that her name not be revealed and filmed and be filmed in silhouette. We did that. After that release of that first documentary, all her friends, others from the Ciro support group said, well, if she can go out and tell her story, so can I. They came forward and told their story without being in silhouette and with their real names being used that ended up spawning a whole new set of people that came forward and were inspired to tell their story and to date there's been almost 20 that we put on camera who have would have never have done so if it wasn't for the pioneers uh, people such as yourself travis so with that being said each time one of you speaks or the other such as you, Tracy, has the opportunity to put their story on the big screen. You truly inspire them. Now, over the 40 years, Travis, that you have been dealing with this, because this story of yours made headlines the moment it happened. How many people have you seen that told you privately that they were taken, essentially come forward that they publicly that they were taken afterwards? Now, now, what was the question again? How many people uh, who, who came oh, oh, Over the years that the people, that over the years from in your, the moment you started talking about your case publicly, that people confided into you that they were also abducted. How many have you seen over the course of, despite however many years, even if up to 40, finally come out and speak openly? Oh, 
there's been a few. Um, I, I I can't really name names, but you know, there's um, there's been quite a few, and you know, um, the the whole issue of skepticism and good cases versus bad cases. You know, I, I know there's a lot of uh, people who come to me who you know report experiences that you know that I believe are you know sincere that it's it's a real event, but. At the same time, I think there's some who are sincere who probably didn't experience something on the same level that I did. And uh, that's one of the kind of the false perceptions, uh, po false representations that the skeptical people try to uh, uh, portray about the UFO field is that the, is that the investigators are just blindly accepting everything. And the, and the truth is, you know, that most of the organizations, most of the um, investigators probably uh, reject the majority of the cases. The, the higher percentage are ones they don't accept uh, because of this phenomenon you're talking about, this, this imitation or copycat thing or, you know, even a subconscious sort of influence to, to where they're not deliberately being deceptive. They, they just they believe something happened that... They didn't. So, sorry, Travis. John in London. Um, I was wondering: is there, you know, of the cases that you've met of people that come up to you and confide in you with their, you know, their personal experience, is there any one particular one that stands out among the rest to you? Yes, but like I said, <laughs> I'm not going to get into naming names. There are some that I think are just absolutely BS, and there's some that I think are solid, but. Uh, I'm not going to get into the situation where I'm sorting the, the wheat from the chaff because I always swore that I would not do that unless I had thoroughly investigated the case because you really don't have the right to do so unless you you know, get the facts first. That was what I uh, really you know, felt the most outrage about was people that were judging our report with, and they hadn't even looked at the facts. They didn't have any idea you know, what was claimed or reported or anything and they're already attacking it so you know while i respect your anonymity to to your certain friends and people that have confided you you say there are some cases where things have stuck out that you put down as possibly this is genuine rather than you know chaff and wheat separating it separating it but w with the situation that you were in you, you know it's a very unique situation there's not a lot of people that that do come forward like yourself what is it that made that the individuals that have come to you over the years stand out without putting names to it? But is it because of something that you've experienced that you know that, you know, no one else could experience that? Is there anything that you can give us, you know, because there are many people all around the world, including myself, who's been into your case for many years and has always wanted to ask hundreds of questions. But obviously, I realize we're very short on time. And, and I just really wanted to get your perspective of it. What, what is so different about an alien abduction? compared to, say, a military abduction or, or just being abducted in the general sense? What's different that, that you know is, you know, real and, and it's not, you know, made up? Yeah, well, it's kind of like the definition of obscenity. You, you know it when you see it. <laughs> and it's different every time, you know. I, I, I would hesitate to, you know, uh, lay out a description of what would pass in that regard. For very good reason, I could imagine, and especially what you just said earlier, that not to make any presumptions about any case until you looked at everything, because you've been the butt of those very same jokes from people such as Philip Class, which surprisingly, or sat very sad to have seen that, but not surprisingly, all their their arguments and claims were always without merit, always circular reasoning. Tracy, just as I posed the same question earlier to Travis, you too are a, a rock star, a hero amongst people who have been taken because you took the most important case or one of, if not the most important cases, the Travis Walton story and put it on the big screen and therefore gave it a voice where otherwise it wouldn't have had such a voice. I'm sure you are, you too have also been confided with so many people who want their cases either to be, at least to be heard by somebody else, or I'm sure you get so much, so many requests more than anybody I would imagine in this film business in Hollywood to make a film about their cases. 
And that sort of leads into your the 701 question. I was just wondering, I know what that number means. I know everyone else here knows what that number means, but everybody listening may not know. Can you talk briefly about what that means? Well, yeah, thank you for the kind words, by the way, Dr. J. But, uh, yes, yeah, 701 was the, the Air Force study that went on from 1947 to, I believe, 1969. Um, one of the things that we, we've discovered in doing research for this film is that so many cases were labeled explained that the Air Force investigated, but were really not explained. An example would be there'd be a sighting. The Air Force would say, oh, the planet Jupiter was very bright that night. We think it was the planet Jupiter. Then an astronomer would come forward a couple days later and say, Jupiter wasn't even visible on that side of the Earth at that time. But the Air Force would not then take off the explained category and admit that it was now unexplained. They would maintain that it was explained. So there are a number of cases that are listed as explained, which are silly. I mean, they really just don't stand the test of time. But even despite that, when the Air Force shut down Project Blue Book in 1969, they admitted to having 701 unexplained cases. And when they say a case was unexplained, it was really unexplained. It, it was something where they had tried desperately by hook or by crook to give it an explanation, and it still had no explanation. So we thought calling the film 701 was kind of like an inside joke uh, sort of amongst us by saying this is kind of a classic example of how the subject as a whole has not been adequately explained. And that's why we chose the number as the title of the movie. I think one great thing that everyone needs to remember is for, in terms of skeptics, debunkers, or the, the government as a whole, we only need one. They have 701 that they labeled as unexplained. We just take one of those and prove it as t to, be, to, to be what it is, if it's extraterrestrial, extra dimensional, and the whole argument is one. And that's why I think it's so good to have such a high number that they stamped. Because, as you mentioned, they really tried to debunk everything, as uh, Hynek said at the end when he finished his Project Blue Book tenure, said that when he created the, uh, the swamp gas explanation, he really was trying to find something. What's the most absurd explanation you've seen when you were going through the reports of Blue Book to, uh, you know, to, for, to do research for your next uh, movie. Well, I think that the Lonnie Zamora case is a case that we really focus on, the Socorro, New Mexico case, for your audience. I'm sure some many of them are familiar with it. And again, the links that they went to to try to explain that case away. Uh, in fact, recently on the Internet, uh, I suddenly was you know, told by somebody, hey, do you know that the Lonnie Zamora case has now been proven to be a hoax? And I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding. And I went and checked it out on the Internet. And if anybody has seen the, the explanation that came out a couple of years ago, it's absolutely absurd. It involves, you know, releasing a balloon and having the balloon fool everybody and then hiring midgets and dressing them in white uh, coveralls to go running around the desert to make them uh, – uh, appear to be aliens. I mean, I'm not making this up. I mean, this is really what, what I read on the internet a couple of years ago. And I think, you know, even if you look at Travis's case, even though I'm not even sure if Travis's case was a Blue Book case, I guess it wouldn't be because Blue Book would have been shut down by that time. But if you look at the explanations that people have come up with for Travis's case, again, you're into the realm of the absurd. And I think when I was very young and I first started reading about UFOs, the first thing that convinced me that there must be something to it is the extraordinary lengths that the so-called skeptics went to to explain these things away. And I thought to myself even back then, if they're doing these kind of gymnastics to try to explain these cases away, then, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There must be something to this. And I remember thinking that even at a very early age.
I definitely have the same reasoning when I was growing up and reading the explanations too. It's like not everything is planet Venus. Not everything is a star. You know, just the the absurdity to some of them was just like you said, where there's smoke, there's fire. And that got me. It's as if they don't want you to look this direction by making up this BS Mr. Jay, it's... people, when they're desperate to to not believe something, people who are fearful, they will latch on to the silliest explanation, you know, and just to put their own mind at ease, even though it's it's just preposterous, you know. If you, I, if you I also want to tell you that when when I first got involved with Travis and first met Travis, I was not a hundred percent convinced that his case was real. I thought there was a chance that this was some kind of a hoax. And that did not dissuade me from wanting to do the movie. I thought if it turns out that it's a hoax, it could be an even more interesting movie in some weird way. Uh, But it's only after meeting Travis and getting to know him, finding out what a person of integrity he was. Once you get to know Travis, you come to realize that he's about the last person on earth that would sell his soul for fame. I mean, that is just not the, the type of guy that he is. But I, I want everyone to know that if the evidence had led me to believe that this was an elaborate hoax of some kind, that's what I would have uh, portrayed in the film. I didn't have a, an axe to grind. And, you know, I love what you mentioned about Travis. Once you get to know him, you realize he is absolutely the last person. He doesn't want to be in the limelight. I've never heard him exaggerate. When he says something, what he says, he means it. He doesn't add an extra inch to it for for good or for bad. So when when he was... I couldn't imagine being on the other side of the things Philip Klass said to you, Travis. And, And just the things that I've read in my life... Uh, from your case, some of them really made me personally angry. And I don't want to go into it too much because there's so much of the BS out there. But can you just list a couple of the most BS accusations they accused you when saying that you hoaxed your incident? Oh, well, you know, probably one of the most uh, popular ones at the time was that it was a drug hallucination. Uh, <laughs> but I had uh, blood and urine samples put through the county medical examiner's drug screen, which proved there was no trace of any drug in my body. But why was that necessary? I mean, the six other people had the same experience, and uh, drug hallucinations don't affect uh, seven people identically. Uh, it's just, it was, it was silly on the face of it. Uh, that is extremely silly to, to assume that, okay, so you may have had a hallucination about it, but that doesn't mean that the other six people ha- had this, didn't have the same one. I mean, what were these skeptics thinking? And one thing that I could never just overcome was they were really more willing to and hoping to believe that your friends had murdered you than had actually seen what they saw. I never, to this day, I can't get over that. Yeah, that's isn't, isn't that amazing? Oh, and the evidence, uh, had they just simply come in and said they saw Alan kill me, they wouldn't even have asked the other five people to take a lie detector test. The testimony of five without lie detector would have been sufficient to put somebody on death row. But if they saw a UFO suddenly with past lie detector tests, and there's 16 of them now, 16 past tests, that's not enough for some people which is really kind of odd. Don't you think that uh, we've either, you know, raised the bar too high for UFOs or it's too low to be putting somebody on death row? You're absolutely right. I think it's it's too high and also the criminal standard is a little bit too low or just uh, I think people's mindset to to want to stay safe or to want to stay in their zone of what they know is just like Stanton Friedman always says, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is already made up. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what I think worries. But I think we're coming to, we're better off now than we were in the past. And and the only thing I could cite as reasoning aside from the youth who anybody born after, any anybody who's 22 or younger started kindergarten after extraterrestrial planets were discovered. So I meet so many people that are young that without a doubt in their mind 
you know, we're not alone or we've already been visited. So that's one reason. The other reason is, is every time I saw a documentary on anything with regards to UFOs in the 80s or one made in the 70s or even in the 90s, for every one minute saying anything about the case, you'd have one minute of a debunker. And now you have almost every major network having these shows and you don't see a minute of a skeptic such as uh, McGahey or or Nichols or, or Schaefer, any of those popular guys that you would see in the 90s. Uh, I'm going to ask either one of you this or both of you can chime in. We'll start with Tracy on this one. Do you think that shows on itself as de facto that we've actually moved in a better place or is that just TV portraying this in a better light and we the ridicule factor is absolutely still there. Well, you know, I, I half agree with what you're saying in that I believe that the that the general population is more open to the idea of extraterrestrials uh, in, in general. I think that the idea that, that we're not alone in the universe, which seems like it's an absurd notion to me, uh, I think that the younger generation is more open to the idea that we are going to find extraterrestrial life. On the other hand, though, I think the UFO battle is sort of slowly being lost. Uh, I think that uh, there's there's sort of like a less of an understanding even now about the phenomena than there was years ago. I think it's sort of lost some popularity, and uh, I think that unfortunately we're in a phase now where uh, there's an expectation because of everybody having video cameras that maybe the the mystery would have been solved and we would have that penultimate video that nobody could deny. And really, we have to be honest and say that hasn't really happened. And I think personally that, that the phenomena is self-concealing and that it actually takes steps to conceal itself, that that's one of the things that's apparent by the way that it manifests itself. So I think that Whoever is behind the UFO phenomena also knows that we all have video cameras now. <laughs> and I think that they actually take steps to make sure that they don't end up on the evening news. But uh, at the same time, I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic about the uh, phenomena and how it's perceived by the public because I basically find that, that – uh, the interest is not where it should be on it. Thank God there are people like you, Dr. J, that are telling people, telling the world the ultimate truth. But there's not a lot of you out there. There's most people are are pretty ignorant about it, unfortunately. Thank you, know, and, Tracy, and I'm out there all the time, and I've got, I'm not getting that sense at all. I mm. think acceptance has grown exponentially. It's it's changed so much. Back in the day, it was, uh, when this first happened to me, it was so easy, you know, to equate belief in UFOs with being a kook. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it has come so far now, what with Hubble Telescope actually being able to enumerate the other extrasolar planets that are, uh, that are likely Earth-like. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's where they can actually count them in the thousands. It's, it's to the point now where the people who believe we're alone in the universe, those are the kooks. Those are the people, who the, the flat earthers. Well, I, Tracy, I agree. This is, this is John in London. I wanted to ask you, you know, because when you made your, your movie Fire in the Sky, you particularly used a, a, a certain type of alien that, in fact, is not the general, you know, bug-eyed alien or the, the typical Zeta directly gray it was a very strange-looking old gentleman type sort of character. C can you tell me where the idea or the concept came from using this type of alien compared to the normal Zeta Rectili Grey? Sure. Uh, it, it, to make a long story short, it, and it's kind of an ironic story, I had just done a, a, a miniseries called Intruders on CBS, and they re-ran Intruders one night on TV. It was actually the second airing of it, and a Paramount executive happened to see it and suddenly went sort of ballistic and said, oh, my God, the same kind of aliens that are in Fire in the Sky, because I was at that point in pre-production on Fire in the Sky. He said, oh, my God, they've been shown before. They've been on this movie Intruders, and we're sunk. We can't do the movie. 
So we actually had to convince Paramount for a second time to make the movie. They were ready to pull the plug on the movie, believe it or not, thanks to intruders of all of the ironies. And they came to us and basically said, we are one inch away from shutting down the production unless you completely change the alien sequence in the movie. So the director and myself and Travis all got together and tried to come up with an alternate version of what really happened that didn't, didn't stray too far away from the truth, but also was not what really happened. My original script for Fire in the Sky, the alien sequence was identical to what Travis reported. I mean, I literally followed it like a map. And I was not involved in the alternative discussions about how to change it. That, that came as a bit of a shock to me. No, so, so we, we ultimately had to come up with an alternate version of the movie, which was not my first choice and not what I would have done if I had my druthers. But it truthfully was the only way of keeping the film alive. We were very close to having the plug pulled on us uh, because when the Paramount executive had seen that sequence in Intruders, he saw little gray guys with big eyes and people lying on tables and uh, stuff like that. And it was like uh, uh, eye-opening to him. He had never known that that type of thing was pretty well known. So it was unfortunate, and I wasn't... It, if we could do it all over again and I had my way, I would have followed the real story a lot closer because I think the real story is, is more interesting in many ways. But it was really our only way to, to resurrect the film. Isn't it sad that uh, the, an executive's decision like that could really alter the course of you showing what history, essentially history? And more so, I think that if that same executive had been well-versed in this topic, he would have seen the intruders a clip that... that portion that got him scared uh, i've seen the crossover with fire in the sky and realized that that's just the way that people are seeing these things and trans and 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 describing them it's not necessarily unique to that situation because as you both have seen since the release of the film and travis since you've experienced this that this transcends everybody on every country in every country and of every creed race social status, it doesn't make a difference. Now, I'm going to come back full circle because, Tracy, you mentioned the intruders. So this, I'm going to ask you both about uh, Debbie's case before we move on and wrap this up with what you guys are going to be speaking on in Ciro. Obviously, I could see where your your idea to have Debbie's uh, life shown in this teleseries of intruders based on bud hopkins book because of what you've seen with your own eyes at bud hopkins home what did you feel of the case that you thought you should pick her case to show on television versus all the other ones that he was that bud hopkins was researching at the time well i was really glad that bud chose debbie to write an entire book around because she's such a wonderful person she, she's the classic example of somebody who's very down to earth, not looking for fame, not looking for to try to become famous on the back of a UFO incident. She was a victim again. She was a person who was picked despite her wishes, who went through a lot of frightening and emotional experiences. Um, it was a real pleasure to get to know her. I, I was really honored to be able to sit in on many of her sessions. And uh, I think uh, it's people like Debbie and Travis are the classic examples, again, of people who, who are quality people who happen to have something fall down from the sky and happen to them that they had no control over. And I have a great empathy for those people. I really feel like uh, it's very hard for the average person out there to really understand what they've gone through because of this. Uh, Travis has now come out the other end, and he's really, uh, I think, mastered his experience and learned to live with it in a really good way. 
but for a long time, including around the time that I met him, which was 10 years after the incident, he was a very scarred person back then. I mean, this thing had really scarred him in a lot of ways. So I think that, that that's one element that the average reader or the average person that reads about these stories or finds out about these stories doesn't fully understand. And that's the, you know, the emotional uh, impact that these events take on them. Well said. And I agree with you. These two people are very, they're people that don't want to be in the limelight down to earth. And from the moment I first met Travis to now, he has never exaggerated anything, not just about his case, his story. I'm talking about anything in his life. And that's why when you just get to talk to Travis, you really know that without looking at anything else, I, I just know he's telling telling it like it is. And then, of course, when you look at all the evidence, you just, it can't be denied. Travis, what did you feel? To, this is a two-part question. How did, did you react to the miniseries in, Intruders when you saw Debbie's case? And then secondly, how did you feel when Tracy contacted you knowing that he produced such an outstanding series and was interested in making a film about your life or well, your experience? Uh, I, my, I have to confess that I, I didn't watch Intruders and uh, I still haven't. <laughs> it's been my, I, I've really avoided the subject in in general. I mean, of course it comes to me and I I hear stuff by osmosis, but, you know, people ask me, you know, um, like I'm an authority in, on UFOs, and I really don't know that much about the subject in general because I've avoided it so much. But, you know, I, 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 the only thing I'm an expert on is what happened to me. And, uh, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, I've collected thousands of letters and emails from people who wished that they had uh, portrayed the incident as it really happened. And I think that in the long run, that would be something that a studio would uh, would uh, base uh, consideration of uh, remaking the movie in, at some time in the future. Well, there's a lot of remakes going on right now, uh, and I think the time is ripe for things that were f- made in the 70s, 60s, 80s, 90s to be remade. So there's a very ripe opportunity if anyone out there is looking, or Tracy, if you got any ideas after 701. Now, let's r- go wrap this. Before we uh, – we're not quite wrapped up, and I was just going to say let's switch gears to talk about Ciro – but before we do that, I wanted to give both of you a chance real quick to talk about your personal websites, where people can find you, and what's next for you. I know in the beginning of this hour, Travis, we talked about what's going to happen in November, if you want to start with that and anything else in between. Well, I'm uh, hosting a conference here uh, at- in Heber Overgard, the town nearest where my incident happened, uh, on the 40th anniversary. I've invited a number of uh, internationally known speakers, and um, we're going to, you know, have a uh, on-site tour on the anniversary of the incident. So that's something that people are really showing a lot of interest in. And that's skyfiresummit.com, right? Yeah, that's the website, skyfiresummit.com. Last year, the 39th anniversary, did you know of this fantastic footage that was actually caught during your Skywatch? Have you seen that? Uh, no. Is that, I don't know what to use to explain it. You know, I'm not going to go like Philip Glass and try to reach to find every explanation because I generally don't know. But it is something that I would genuinely give a second look to because it doesn't look like it was something that's photoshopped. I don't know until anyone runs any tests, of course, but just on the face of it, the shock from the people, what they're watching is truly great. So maybe there is something to that area. Maybe that's why they were there that night and you guys saw what you saw when you finished your job of uh, cutting down the trees. And that's maybe why, but I don't know. And the point being is something clearly happened in that film and that has been circulating and i'm sure if you use the right keywords of your event you'll find it you're also speaking at contact in the desert where i will be too anything that's may 26th through or may 29th through june 1st joshua tree california and as we mentioned earlier contact in the desert.com for the details contact in the desert.com slash drj for 
tickets, anything else that you're or winning tickets, anything else you're speaking at be, aside from zero on April 4th? Well, I'm speaking in Australia that month, but uh, there's a bunch of them, and <clears throat> I will update my schedule uh, at TravisWalton.com for all the events uh, coming up. I'll be speaking at uh, Roswell this 4th of July, too. And there we go. That's exactly what I was hoping for. So there are several, and people can go on TravisWalton.com and see the information. Now let's go to Tracy. Tracy, do you have a website, anything that people can reach out and contact you, and where will you be speaking or have any uh, meet and greets or engagements of any kind? Uh, uh, well, open? I've got two speaking things coming up. I'm going to speak at Travis's 40th anniversary thing, and then also I guess I'm speaking at MUFON in oh, I think Orlando, Florida in the spring. Um, I've just done a couple of kind of interesting documentaries that I appeared in. Uh, Chaos on the Bridge, which is the uh, true story of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, I think the William Shatner hosts. So that was kind of interesting meeting him. I did a 90-minute interview with him for that. And also, I guess, Mr. Mirage Man. I guess, have you seen Mirage Man, Dr. J.? Actually, that's on my queue to watch. You know, I have a movie list, a running movie list, and that is one of the ones that is up to watch next. And I've been fascinated about that since I believe Stanton Friedman was the one that first told me about that film. Yeah, I think it's a pretty important film because it's a film where Air Force intelligence actually goes on camera and admits to spreading disinformation in the UFO community. So it's pretty pretty interesting film. I was pretty pleased with it when I saw it. And then I'm I'm doing the 701 the movie. We're in the middle of production on that right now. And also I've created a TV series with Dan Knopf who's the uh creator of Carnival, the HBO show that I think a lot of people still really like. So we created a comedy together that we sold now. It's called the uh, Where the Heart Is. So that's what's been really taking up my time lately. Do you have a website where anybody can follow any of your work? Well, you know, believe it or not, I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to uh, social media. I'm, I guess I'm on Facebook technically, and people do contact me through Facebook, although I admit that I don't check it out nearly as often as I should. So uh, anyone that I guess wants to contact me can do it through Facebook. I would really be interested on in seeing that interview with with Shatner, the chaos on the bridge, because I know how much of a believer he's been. The, one of the earlier documentaries that I used to show at to essentially watch people to prime them in ufology that was going around in the 90s was UFOs Above and Beyond, hosted by him. And so point being is I think using those celebrities will do us a lot of good. And every time I seem to have a celebrity or politician on this show talking about the subject, people's ears seem to be more open. So as long as we can utilize them properly, I think we're all moving in the right way. Now let's spend the remainder of the time and let's talk about Ciro International, an organization uh, founded by Yvonne Smith, who everyone heard on the 17th of this month. And, of course, she founded two organizations, Close Encounters Resource Organization, which is her support group for people who have PTSD following alien abduction, and Close Encounters Research Organization, which is the event portion of this where I happily sit on the board of advisors. On Saturday, April 4th, 2015, you will see, of course, Debbie Jordan Cobble, Travis Walton, Tracy Torme, and if near the end, you will have a little moderating session hosted by yours truly. Can we give everyone a little preview of what each of you is going to speak about? We'll start with you, Travis. Well, um, I'm going to try to give my um, more recently evolved perceptions and understandings of what happened to me, you know, rather than just going back and recounting what happened. I, you know, there's a whole lot that, uh, you know, I think we've touched on a few of these uh, subjects tonight, but um, the, um, you know, uh, the newer perspective that I have, that it was more of, a, of an ambulance call than an, ab and then an abduction. I think that's huge revelations for everyone out there who's been following the Travis Walton story, especially coming out of your mouth and your mind to say that as opposed to someone outside looking in. And people are always interested in hearing what you have to say. I witness it for my myself all the time 
when I go to events that you're speaking at because you have the recurring guests, people who want to see you speak each time because they know you have something new to say. So it's always fantastic to see you. Tracy, what about you? Well, Dr. J, I'll probably talk a bit about that sort of uh, period of time when uh, I was uh, going regularly over to Bud Hopkins and uh, and and introduced uh, David Jacobs to Bud and got them together and got David Jacobs started on abductions basically at the time when he didn't believe in them at all. It was kind of amazing. Um, but also I'll probably tell some anecdotes like uh, that, that surprise people in the UFO community. Like, for instance, when Gene Roddenberry called me into his office to basically uh, kind of go ballistic on me for doing Travis's story. And people are always shocked to hear how anti-UFO Gene Roddenberry was. Uh, He was a great mentor of mine, but he hated UFOs and thought that the subject was really ridiculous. So I'll probably uh, end up telling various anecdotes over the years that, that I can recall that I hope the audience would find interesting. Do you still get uh, what is it like to be a filmmaker in Hollywood that has made the most successful film of all time with regards to being based on a true story within ufology? Do you other filmmakers sort of give you any uh, of the ridicule that the general public gets or is it different in within Hollywood? Uh, no, actually, uh, you know, I've gotten sort of known for doing these UFO things. I also worked on the film Contact uh, years ago. Um, and the intruders, fire in the sky, contact, and a few UFO documentaries. I sort of got known for this, which at one point I was kind of shying away from. I really didn't want to be typecast as like the Hollywood UFO guy. Uh, but I've, I've learned to sort of embrace it more as the years have gone by. And I'm, uh, and, and I do get contacted pretty regularly by people that want to make UFO movies. I was recently contacted about maybe doing the Betty and Barney Hill story, uh, which I think could be interesting because I think when they did make it, it was a TV movie and they didn't really have the budget for the special effects that were needed. So I'm kind of interested in that. And and now I'm much more open when people approach me about these things. I sort of tried to get away from it for a while because I didn't want to be typecast. But uh, now I I appreciate it more, and I do think it's a really important subject, and I think it's a very sadly misunderstood subject. I think that's where the great opportunity lies, because I think the real truth about UFOs and what it really is all about and what it really means, not well understood by the world. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with 701, is to try to sort of really set the record straight and take a very honest look at what the phenomena is all about. Well, you are a true hero for what you've been doing. And even if there's been people or you were, you were avoiding to be typecast, and if, even if there were people that were ridiculing you or anything along the lines of that, the fact that you've stayed your course and have ended up producing these top films and are going to continue down this path means that you are doing all of us a great service. So we must thank you. Uh, Tracy and Travis, it has been a true honor. And I want to give you both a chance to give one final message to everybody out there. And since Tracy I just finished with you, might as well go back, get final words with Tracy Torme. Well, thank you very much. That was very kind what you said. I appreciate it very much. I think that uh, it's an important subject it, it's a misunderstood subject and that everyone should really take a good look at the evidence and they will come away believing that there is something going on, there is something to it, and uh, the people that have had the abduction experience do not deserve to be ridiculed or made fun of. Uh, people need to be empathetic with them and to appreciate what they've gone through. Well said. Thank you. Those were the words by Tracy Torme. And now we turn to a very famous, uh, be, so in part by the movie Fire in the Sky, and because his case has so much cr- evidence and credibility that you just can't deny, and that being Travis Walton. Any final words for everybody, Travis? Well, it's really a, a, a repeat of the same sentiment, you know. Uh, if anyone wants to judge the validity of these sorts of phenomena, get the facts first. Take a thorough, objective, fair 
examination of the evidence before you draw any conclusions. And, you know, uh, like I said, the investigators uh, don't uh, accept every case. You know, some things wind up turning out to be meteors or airplanes or, or whatever. Uh, it, all it requires is that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft for it to be a profound phenomena of great importance to humanity. Well said. Just like I said earlier, we just need that one case. Gentlemen, it has been a fantastic time as always. Everyone will have a blast seeing you Saturday, April 4th, CeroInternational.com, C-E-R-O. And with that being said, thank you both. Wow, Johnny. Having the most famous case, Travis Walton, and of course the most famous filmmaker for ufology, Tracy Torme, on just sends a message. What does alien abduction mean to you, or the importance of it mean to you? Well, it's interesting, John, because you know, for me, alien abduction is someone who's taking you beyond your will, and you know, I can only imagine um, in, in a living state where people are taken, say, by the police or, or by army or whatever you know situation, to be taken by an entity that we're so unfamiliar with. I could only find possibly terrifying. Um, I think it's, you know, spiritual. I think it's something to do with demons or, or aliens. These are the things that come to mind um, that, that frighten the life out of me. And that's why I, I'm, I'm interested in what people have to say about it from their own experiences, just like Travis there. As am I, and this is exactly why I keep bringing on people who have either experienced with the, themselves, have been victims of alien abduction, or experts such as Kathleen Martin or Yvonne Smith or Dr. David Jacobs, people who study this, or the person who has made the only movie, big screen movie that has taken place about this subject, and that is being Tracy Torme. With that being said, it's been another fascinating show, everybody. Be sure and check out our upcoming guests at drjradiolive.com, drjradiolive.com. Contact us via the website or any social media account under the same name, DRJ Radio Live. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twi Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, Google+, Gmail, you name it. Everything's under that account. And with that being said, this is Dr. J with my co-host live in London, Johnny Webb. And we are both signing out. Mm -hmm.